There are some really hot topics right now. The first one I would say is authorizations. Um, as we're seeing more and more patients and we're using more molecular testing and more new sophisticated drugs, getting these covered by payers has been our biggest challenge. We're spending almost 30% of our time now on getting authorizations for both testing and also for the therapies we need to use, which means those that's time we're not seeing patients. And that's actually becoming a fairly big deal. Um, Peter, where do you think kind of some of the national trends are going yeah, on that? I would say the national trends are going, uh, unfortunately, in the direction of requiring almost uh, everything getting a prior authorization that looks like it is even slightly complicated. I will say to you that as at Nord, um, we basically provide patient assistance business for uh, those people who can't afford their drugs. And I will say to you that over the last couple of years, it's grown from about 30% of those patients that require a prior authorization to last year, 100% of the patients required a prior authorization. And so it's not only work at your end, it's work at our end after the script is written and we're trying to get the patient on therapy that we're seeing these prior authorizations take weeks and longer before we can get some of the patients on therapy. I'd say another big issue is natural history data on patient groups. Um, historically, when we find a new rare disease, we'll see data on the first five to ten patients, someone publishes that, and then that kind of becomes the natural history that everyone assumes. What we find almost always is that there's a much larger group of patients who have a much wider variety of findings. One of the big projects Nord's doing right now is natural history studies in these rare diseases. And we're finding out what's the life spectrum look like? You know, what's the initial phase of the disease look like? But also what do these diseases look like 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the pipeline? And the only way to really get this kind of data on small groups of patients, you can't do cross-sectional. So you have to do longitudinal. So Peter, how do you think it's, the- I think really story? important. One of the things that we have done is with our relationship with the FDA, as we talk to the FDA about the importance of natural history and what that means in de-risking the drug development process. And the FDA had urged us to continue on in this process. We actually partnered with the FDA. They gave us some funding to help build some longitudinal natural history systems beyond, as what Marshall was saying, looking at the five or 10 that may in individuals that may, in, may be in that disease state. Mar right now, Nord has um, a website that gets a million and a half people a month coming to it. And so we are utilizing, putting out the, the word that we have a natural history in a particular disease state, and then capturing people globally to come and join that, that uh, natural history system. And the agency is now using the data that we're we're developing out of those um, natural histories to help build new biomarkers and just basically help de-risk the drug development process. One of the other places we're partnering with Nord is there's a limited workforce in the field of genetics and rare disease. Um, there's probably well under a thousand physicians total practicing in the field and may actually be under 500. Uh, wait times at all of the clinics where patients are coming for diagnosis can be as much as a year to two years. So we're trying to new ways to do that. We, the nice thing is we can kind of throw out some of the old models. We can start looking at digital access. We can start looking at digital triage. One thing we need to do is push more tools into the hands of primary care providers, the frontline folks, so that they can get a quick read on whether a patient needs more workup or if that's a patient they can safely watch or even walking them through the workup because there are parts of the world where there is no specialization in rare disease. There are parts of the U.S. where there's nobody covering these patients. So I think one of the things we're partnering with Nord and working on new solutions for this and I think we're almost liberated from the fact that the situation is so bad because there are so few people, we can try these new things. Another issue we run across is DNA testing. It's I think there's a misapprehension in the community, in the medical community, that it will do more than it actually can do. Um, so it's in an intermediate phase right now. We know how to do it physically. We can do lots and lots of DNA sequencing. What to do with the results, though, is a lot more problematic because there's kind of three answers you get. You get a yes, no, and a maybe, and currently maybe is the most common answer, uh, particularly when you start sequencing literally millions to billions of bases of DNA. So. One thing we try to educate um, the physician community about is DNA testing often will not give you an answer. It may confirm a suspicion you have. It may sometimes pull a diagnosis out, but it really needs to be done currently in experienced hands. So trying to do it out of a primary care practice, I think almost creates more problems than it does. It's one of those things, don't go into the woods without a friend. Um, this is a place where that's definitely wanted. Nord's got some great stuff going with trying to provide 
access to sequencing for patients with different symptom complexes, with different potential disease states. That's a very exciting project. Um, but I think right now we're in that intermediate phase where it hasn't become a frontline tool yet. I think that's a really important point because we, we represent, um, right now we have a membership of 280 rare disease disease-specific organizations, and I think to Marshall's point, it's sort of a yes, no, or a maybe, and the answer is maybe most of the time, and I think that most of the patient groups see this as perhaps the the key answer, and uh, that they're going to go and have this done, and that everything's going to be resolved once the tests come back and the results come back, and we're finding that, as, as Marshall indicated, there's a lot of work that goes on. It may give you a a sense in a right direction and so on, but it's far from the final answer. And I think that yeah. I think that's really right. So we're doing a lot of education on the patient side about expectations around the genetic testing. So one of the exciting fields is the development of genetic therapies. Now I've been in the field since the 1980s and we've been talking about um, DNA therapy since then, but some of them are finally crossing the finish line. We have uh, treatments now for genetic eye diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. Um, there are a lot coming out for some of the biochemical disorders. I think it still has a few more years in the development phase, but it sort of looks like that train may be finally coming towards the station. Then we've got to gear up for a whole new medical model, as opposed to the chronic treatment of a genetic disease. We now have to look at the acute treatment of a diagnosed genetic disease, which places more importance on getting the diagnosis right early, and then making sure you pick exactly the right therapy, because you kind of get a one and done with that and you want to make sure you do the right one. Yeah, let me, I, I want to just say, I think that the, one of the biggest issues that I see moving forward right now is the fact that science is progressing very rapidly um, and the payer system, for example, is not, is not progressing as quickly. And so we're seeing lots of new therapies being developed, some that are quite expensive, and getting into the formulary, but the patient's not having access to them. So I think from a patient perspective, we're really worried about access and making sure that if something is FDA approved, the patient should have access to it. And uh, that's turning out to be a problem right now because of that gap between the scientific um, speed, if you will, right now of development and where we are actuarially in trying to figure out how to pay for some of these drugs moving forward. So it's going to be a challenge over the next few years as we try to work that out.